This is an Enigma machine. Its basic principle is that if you press a letter on the keyboard, it scrambles the letter by sending an electrical signal from the depressed key through the plug board at the front, through a series of three rotors, reflected via the reflector, and back through the three rotors and the plug board before finally reaching the lamp board where a letter would light up. With every key press, the right-hand rotor would advance by one step. This changed the path of the signal through the rotors and meant that the encryption of the input letter changed with every key press. So you've got to decode a message, you need to know how the machine is set up for that given day. There are over 100,000 ways to set up the rotors alone. In addition to this, the Germans used six plugboard leads at the front and that multiplied this key space by a phenomenal 7 billion billion. The German military used code books which described how the Enigma machine was set up for that given day, both on the sending and receiving ends. They described the connections of the plugboard leads here at the front and the order and position of the rotors at the back. The code that the Enigma machine produced was universally thought to be unbreakable. The Enigma feature is that it scrambles the letters using a special sort of encryption in which, for example, if the letter A encrypts to the letter J, then at the same set of rotor positions, the letter J would encrypt to the letter A. The Enigma operator at the receiving end merely had to type in the cipher text and the plain text would emerge. But ultimately, this feature was one of the reasons that the Allies were able to break into the Enigma. During the 1930s, the Germans had additional steps in their protocol of sending and receiving messages. Instead of every operator throughout Germany's military starting the message with the same rotor settings, an operator would instead encrypt and send a three-letter header. The operator would then use these three-letter message keys as the starting point for the rotors for the message they're going to send. The protocol required that this key was always transmitted twice. In other words, there would be a six-letter header to each message. So, for example, if you were to choose the message key NHK, you'd first type into the Enigma machine NHK, NHK, Z, C, O, P, G, O. But there's one critical flaw of the procedure. Enter Marian Rayevsky. He noticed one simple pattern with the fact that this message key was entered twice. The first and fourth letters are the same, the second and fifth are the same, and the third and sixth are the same. Using complex mathematics, these very simple pieces of information gave Rayevsky a wealth of insight into how the Enigma machines were set up for that day. There was a very strong relationship between how an Enigma machine was set up and what were known as characteristic cycles. In order to exploit these relations and break into the cipher, one first needed to intercept about 80 messages on a given day and have a catalogue mapping these characteristic cycles to the Enigma starting positions. So you calculate the characteristic cycles from the first six letters of the 80 or so intercepted messages, then you'd look these characteristics up in the catalogue, and that would give you the possible Enigma rotor starting positions. Creating this catalogue entirely by hand would take too long. Rafsky instead devised a machine to speed this up. This machine was the cyclometer. The cyclometer is conceptually a wonderfully simple design. It was, in essence, two Enigma systems side by side and electrically linked together. The second rotor system is set three steps ahead of the first, linking letters of that repeated message key, three steps apart. Electrical current bounces back and forth between the two rotor systems, and bulbs on the lamp board illuminate and indicate the characteristic cycles. One will then record these cycles and move to the next rotor position and repeat to create the catalogue. Once the catalogue was complete, it took the Polish just 10 to 20 minutes to obtain the Enigma setup for the day. The core to the workings of the cyclometer is the rotors and reflectors. 
Here is one of the rotors, the only parts we had outsourced. All the rest, either I or the workshop, manufactured in-house. It's a phenomenal piece of engineering. You can see what it looks like on the inside here, where the wires link the brass pins and pads together. And they're all completely hardwired and with silk-covered lining. The Polish cryptologist would have used a cyclometer to create the catalogue. They'd have done it in such a way that they started with the first rotor position. That's AAA, with the right end rotor system stepped three steps on from that. That would be AAD. Now, what they would have done is turned on the switches and counted the number of um, bulbs that lit up, and that would correspond to the characteristic cycles. Now, they would have done this for every single possible rotor position. That's AAA, then AAB, then AAC, all the way down to ZZZ. That's over 17,000 different rotor positions. On top of that, you can arrange the rotors in six different ways. They would therefore have had to have made six different catalogues, taking the total to over 100,000 possible setups. We'll give you an example here. I'm gonna start with the left-hand rotor system as M-I-H. So the right-hand rotor system is three steps on from that. So that's M-I-K. Now, if I turn on the first switch, what we can see here is we've got two bulbs lit up. So that is a unit cycle. So you count the number of bulbs and divide that by two. That's one of the characteristic lengths. That's B. Now you can see here, six bulbs are light up. And what's important to note here, it doesn't matter which uh, letters light up. It just matters on the number that light up. And the reason for this is that the characteristics are entirely independent of the plug board. And this is otherwise known as the theorem that won the war. If we move the rotors to MIO and then MIR and then press letter A, it appears that no bulbs have lit up. And this is where the rear stat comes in. If I, if I move the rear stat in the clockwise direction, you can see that all the bulbs have lit up, all 26. And so that means this characteristic is a pair of 13 cycles. But most of the cycles characteristics were either a pair of cycles like 12, 1 or 3, so 11, 1, 1. But very rarely would they go beyond 3. But when they did, the cataloger would have need pen and paper and jot a few things down as they went along because it was just too hard to remember. The recreation of the cyclometer has its roots in a visit to Bletchley Park. I knew that Alan Turing was one of our most famous alumni at King's College, but the Bletchley Park visit opened my eyes to the enormous contribution he and his colleagues have made to breaking the enigma. I also learned of the work of the Polish cryptographers, but that very little remained to show for it, having been lost or destroyed when the invasion of Poland became imminent. Hal Evans took up the challenge to attempt to recreate the cyclometer at the start of the final year of his degree course. While the operation of the cyclometer is relatively well understood, the only diagram of the machine's physical appearance was from Wojewski's memoirs from after the war. I could have used modern day software to do the job of the cyclometer, but I wanted to design and manufacture the replica to be faithful to the original. I did some research into how these sorts of machines were designed what materials, what sort of techniques for manufacture were used uh, at the time. And then with this in mind, I started my own plans and blueprints 